Welcome back to the channel, you curd nerds. I know, it's um, a slightly different vibe here today, but I didn't move. This is just a hotel. I'm actually down in Vegas and going to be teaching some students in the full motion A320 sim. But that's not what this video is about, so make sure you subscribe and hit that bell icon so you get notified when those full motion sim videos do come out. But what we're doing today is yet another mock check ride. And this one, this one's different. This one's a little different. It's still private pilot, but the big difference is this student took three years, or is it three years? I don't know. Three years to get their private pilot certificate, or at least to get to this point in their training, which is why when people ask me, hey, I'm at 60 hours, or hey, I'm at 50 hours, or hey, I'm at 100 hours, and I still haven't taken my check ride, what's wrong with me? Not a goddamn thing. There's not a goddamn thing wrong with you. I'm going to let you in on a little secret real quick. How many hours did you think it took me, the person you're going to, to look for advice on your training? How long do you think it took me to get my private pilot certificate? I didn't take my check ride until I was at 117 hours. 117. Now, I've had students get their private pilot certificate done in 35 hours, given the 141 requirement of 35 hours. I've also had students take years and hundreds of hours. It doesn't matter. As long as you get the appropriate training and you end up enjoying it, you have the money, and you end up a safe pilot. That's the most important one right there. You end up a safe pilot. So don't let your buddies saying, oh, I got mine in 40, oh, I got mine in 50. I can't believe y'all didn't go to a 141 school and get it done in 35. Don't, don't let them get to you, all right? This student, out of their three years of training, knows damn near everything. I think they got one question wrong on the entire mock check ride. They did amazing. So just because it's taking you a little bit longer doesn't mean you're doing worse. You're probably just absorbing the information more. So let's get into it. Are you okay with us recording this to be used on, you know, any and all social media platforms that come out? Oh yeah, um, definitely. I think I sent, I think I sent one too. Okay. If you see it. Oh, yeah. I'll, 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 you can record it locally for on your end as well. That's not a big deal yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, so, um, let me just make sure I don't need that's anything good. up here. No, I don't need that up. All right. <clears throat> So how's your day going? Oh, I just came from a, from a flight, uh, a pre-check ride flight uh, in a plane. I flew twice in my, just for you to know, I've been, it's been three years since I started this whole thing. There was a period of a little over six months that I quit, you know, flying because of work and all that. Um, so it's kind of like off and on to me, but overall I, I'm doing like maybe two to three flights. And if I got lucky a month, so not exactly too much flying time. I got about a, a little over 120 uh, hours in them three years. Uh, but I decided to push it now to the check ride point because it's getting, you know, to the point where either it's going to go or not going to go. You know, I can't just drop all this money and investment and just say, you know, fuck it. It's, you know, <laughs> yeah. go. so it, it's a little bit of both. And, you know, whatever comes out of it is what, you know, we'll take it to the next step. But definitely worth investing uh, for, you know, to finish it. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Um, and we'll see. We'll take it one step at a time. Yeah. I mean, um, mock check rides are definitely a great way to uh, ensure that you are prepared. And don't worry about it taking three years or, you know, 120 hours. I'm here at this point and it took me 117 to get my private pilot. Um, okay. So don't, don't, be, don't be too concerned. I know a lot of students, they're like, oh, I'm at 100 hours. I'm at 80 hours or what have you. Um, should I just give up now? And it's like, no, don't. It, like, I'm sitting here right in front of you trying to make sure you're ready. And it took me 117. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> believe me. No, I... <laughs> listen, if you know, if you put those things in perspective, then, you know, time is going to be different, you know, with every person, you know, some can do it in three months. Some I heard take two. I, I just actually saw a guy who actually did 20 years without flying. Then he came back to it. I have 25 years. I'm sorry. And I think yeah. it sounds like so, yeah, I mean, yeah. I've had students accomplish private pilot in 30 days and I've had students accomplish private pilot in two years. And if I got you right, you're doing ATPs, right? Like you're a CFI for ATPs. 
Um, so I'm doing the ATP CTP course. Um, we're waiting on the Federal Aviation Administration to come uh, observe our a our um, A320 Program. ATP course um, for me to start doing ATP type ratings in the 320. Uh, so right now, no, I'm not teaching in the 320 for type ratings. I'm teaching in the 320 for the ATP CTP course, which is kind of that like gap fill between small props up to jets. Um, yeah. And we're just waiting on the FAA to have enough money to come observe our course. Like we already have a full course um, and we're just waiting for the FAA to approve it. Well, all the best of luck, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. All right, so let's get right into this. What I like to start with is just how a DPE is going to administer a check ride, right? If you've seen the videos on YouTube, it's the, the same thing every time, right? Um, they're going to ask for all your certificates, okay. your documents, uh, your logbook, right? So they're going to ask for your student pilot certificate. They're going to ask for your medical certificate. They're going to ask for a government-issued photo ID, and they're going to ask for your logbook. If you want to make sure that your logbook has all the appropriate endorsements, the advisory circular 6165H back in the appendix, you're going to look for private pilot, and you're just going to make sure you've got all the appropriate endorsements. Um, make sure that, you know, since you have been doing this for a little while, um, a lot of instructors, they'll just fill out the endorsement that's like pre-printed in the back of the logbook. And sometimes those are dated, right? They're not, they're not accurate anymore. Okay. Um, right. Right. To, right. right? Um, so just make sure that those endorsements are correct. All right. Yeah. I actually um, got over all of my endorsements because it's a, my, my check ride was on, uh, supposed to be March 12th and it got pushed because of work and stuff. And now they're talking, uh, April 2nd. So pretty much right around the corner. So that's why I did this flight this morning to see what's going on, where I'm at and all that. Uh, but I'm definitely, uh, uh, yeah, looking to, to get it done in the next, maybe hopefully in the next two weeks to three weeks if possible. So yes, I got all my stuff in order. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much on top of it. Awesome. Awesome. Um, just make sure, you know, I do see that you got glasses. It's always a good thing to just have an extra spare set spare, yeah. when you go do your check ride. Right. Um, Beyond that, there's going to be three outcomes to every check ride, right? You got satisfactory, unsatisfactory, and incomplete. Satisfactory, that's what everybody wants to hear. Satisfactory means that you're consistently within the standards. It doesn't necessarily mean that you don't fall outside the standards, right? It's not, oh, I dropped five five knots too low or five feet too low. I all of a sudden failed my check ride. Same thing on the oral portion and the knowledge portion. The expectation isn't that you know the answer to every question we ask. A lot of DPEs, what they're going to do is they're going to ask a question, and that one question is the pass for that portion. But then they're gonna keep asking questions to see how far the knowledge goes. And some people get flustered by that because they're like, God damn, I thought I knew this. Why do we keep asking more questions on this? Okay, yeah. so don't let that get you flustered. The DPE is just trying to see where the end of the knowledge is. All right. Okay. Um, then we've got unsatisfactory. That's the thing that nobody wants to hear consistently outside of the standards. You're, um, you have to look up every answer. Basic safety stuff is, um, you know, there, there's big gaps in knowledge for basic safety stuff. And then uh, things like the examiner has to take control of the aircraft to prevent damage, death, dismemberment, et cetera, Definitely. or the violation of a federal regulation. Okay. Right. So if you're about to land on a taxiway and they got to take control. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> obviously. save you from that. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to recover from that. Um, yeah. be like, oh, I was just testing you. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, but then we've got uh, incomplete, right? Incomplete is an option. Uh, incomplete is due to weather, time, safety of flight, anything that's on like the I'm safe checklist. If you really want to look okay. at it, I believe the reg is 6143 Bravo. That has the list okay. of every, every reason that would be appropriate for an incomplete. Oh shit, I'm not prepared is not, you know, an appropriate <laughs> response. Yep, heard that before. Um, but just, you know, make sure that if you are in a check ride, you're, you're nauseous, you don't feel good. You didn't sleep the night before. Um, you're thirsty, right? These are all normal things. If you need to incomplete, if you need to put a pause, let's go get some water. Let's take a break. Um, you know, some check rides, some DPEs, they drag them things out. My oral for instrument was nine hours. Um, okay. wow. I took some breaks. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, no, I've heard some things. Yeah. Um, I'm with right. you. So <laughs> yeah. last question DP is going to ask just to kind of like, this is a, this is a cover their ass kind of question. Uh, have you read the airman certification standards and you understand the standards that you're being held to? Yeah. 
right? Uh, you saying yes to that, there, there's no longer the excuse of, I didn't know that that was going to be checked. Yep, I agree right? with you. <laughs> um, so any questions? Uh, no, let's get on with it. All right, sounds good. So we get into systems <laughs> right off the bat, just because, you know, it's it's pretty straightforward. If you don't understand the aircraft systems, it's going to be, it, the rest of the check ride's not going to go that well. So talk to me about the engine in this thing. What is it? So the engine is, uh, and I don't know if I sent you the STC for that or the uh, 337 for that, but they swapped the engine from an uh, Lycoming O320 to a Lycoming O360. Okay. So the engine has been replaced, and I know there's, uh, I've seen the 337s in the logbook uh, uh, to, to show the uh, the swap of that engine uh, with the manufacturer, uh, not the manufacturer, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, 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 the factory where they installed it. Uh, that had all the paperwork atta attached to the logbook. I've seen that. Okay. So I know so it's there, you... and I know, yeah, and it's a uh, horizontal, it's a, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's a Lycoming O360, four cylinder, air cooled, uh, direct drive or direct driven, uh, carbureted, uh, four cylinder. Um, I think uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, that's, that's about dual it. So what's... Dual, yeah, dual magnetos, you know, the standard. Yep. So what's the um, what's the minimum fuel grade that can go in that? I think it's 80, uh, 80, um, 80 slash 87. Um, that's according to the POH. Now, if I remember correctly, the O's, the 360s. Um, we use a 100 low lead, if that's what yeah. you want to know. Now, you which, what's the lowest grade? Uh, yeah, so what's the lowest grade that's appropriate? Uh, how much horsepower is that thing generating? 180. So from what I'm looking at from Lycoming is the IO360 when, or not the IO360, but the O360 that's rated at 180 horsepower should be using 100 octane. Um, right. But here's the trick on this one again, because they swapped the engine, they did not. Uh, well, the POH that you're looking at is basically for the original, you know, factory, you know, factory. Uh, uh, yeah, the that, 320. That they had it. Right. So I think uh, to answer your quest, your question, I think, OK, so the, the, the grade or the fuel grade that needs to be put into this airplane is 100 low lead. Yes. Um, so the POH is is saying 80 or 87, right? Which is what would be appropriate for the 150 horsepower, 320, right? Right. right. Um, I know the 360 is like one of the few Lycoming engines that you cannot get a MoGas STC that would drop you back down to an 80 or 87 octane. Uh, Cause I have that engine. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> but, <clears throat> and so this thing's got a primer on it, right? Um, on the one I'm using, I think they took the primer. Yeah, I think there might be a primer. I think they're, they, yeah, they got the primer on. Yeah, they still got it okay. on. I know they removed some of the airplanes. They removed the primers off. Uh, this one still got it on. Um, so what's that primer doing? Like when it's you go to use that pump. primer? Hmm? It's, it's basically, it's a pump, a manual pump to push the, the actual fuel in the, in the lines into the combustion area. All or right. not to the combustion. I'm sorry. Not to the combustion. To the, uh, um. Um, to push the fuel in the line towards the uh, uh, carburetor. Um, so the primer actually has three injectors that squirts it right around the intake valve. Um, it's not putting it to the carburetor. If you look to the POH on the fuel diagram, um, you'll actually see that it's got, at least again, according to the POH you sent me, um, but again, this is how most uh, primer systems work because they have three little, like, squirters injectors that squirt right at the intake valve um so okay. that the fuel is right there and the reason they do it that way as opposed to um as opposed to squirting it into the carburetor is the carburetor is mounted beneath the engine so if it okay. squirts into the carburetor it can dribble out of the engine and then that that's where you get a huge risk of fire if you go to your poh the pdf poh that you sent me um, I'm trying to find the digital page. I'm actually, I'm looking at it. It's actually page 22, the digital. Yep. Page. Yeah, I'm looking at so it right now. You see how yeah, you got your carburetor? Yep. I now look where that primer line goes. <clears throat> okay, there you go. So it goes from the uh, float. 
if I may call it the flow or mm -hmm. the uh, the strainer uh, directly into the uh, yeah you're right directly into these uh, three lines that you mentioned the uh, whatever you call them. Yeah, little squirters, think, little injectors. Yeah, yeah. Um, calling them injectors is a little wrong because they're right, not actually fuel not, injectors. Yeah, right. um, so that's just a what a lot of people think is you know once the once that primer starts getting stiff because they do get stiff, they wear out and they're they're kind of a pain to use after you know forty years of the dang thing getting used. Um, they okay. think they can just pump the throttle um, to prime it, but then you run the risk of a, uh, a fire. fire. Yeah, you yeah. run the risk of that fire, right? Um, what would you do if the engine caught fire during flight or not during oh, flight I, during start? Uh, I'd kill the uh, 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 fuel supply or, or the uh, uh, mixture. I'd pull it down. I'd put full power up and I'll continue cranking until until either the engine starts. And if it will, I'll keep it at at least 1700 RPM um, for about a minute. Uh, and then uh, hopefully it'll die before that because there's not going to be any fuel added to the system. Um, uh, I guess that should be it. And then yeah, you know, to exit. Uh, yeah, that's actually uh, exactly it. All right. Uh, let's get into the electric system. So, um, what pretty much what voltage is this? Is this the uh, electric system? Twelve volt. It's a twelve volt battery. Okay. Uh, uh, the electrical system itself is uh, an alternate, a fourteen volt alternator. All right. Um, so it's a 14 volt alternator attached to a 12 volt system uh, going through a, a set of uh, fuses or uh, push button fuses, whatever they call them. Circuit uh, breakers, yep. Circuit breakers. Um, that's pretty yep. much it. That's pretty much it. Yeah, there ain't, ain't, ain't a whole lot going on in this thing's electrical system, right? Well, um, I think there's a reason why they built these pipers like that because they wanted to keep them very, you know, very. Uh, Simple so that, you know, during training, you know, uh, students won't get, go, get too uh, creative, let's put it this way. Yeah, students won't be <laughs> either too creative and there's less stuff to go wrong. There's less stuff yeah. to fail, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, do you have a rough estimate on, let's say your alternator failed. Do you have a rough estimate on how much battery life you'll have left? Okay, so in reality, it'll be probably between 15 to 30 minutes, depending on what system you're going to keep on, you know, running. Uh, because I have uh, one... I think if I remember, I got two G5s in it. The G5s, they have their own battery, so they're going to run for four hours or more. So uh, if, if there is a bus going to them, you can disable that one. That's going to take a few amps off the off the, uh, the battery. Um, and, you know, you just start disabling systems you don't need as you go to increase uh, battery, con uh, to, to decrease battery consumption until you get to where you need to go. Hopefully you'll, you know, find a way to a place to land where you can look at the problem awesome. or that that's in that's in the i would say that's in catastrophic failure of the ele electrical system and the first uh the, the first uh thing or the first interaction i would do is to try to reset the alternator uh button which just turn it off give it about 10 seconds turn it back on see if it works uh run you know run run across the fuses see if anything popped or anything just you know generic stuff but that's that's the game plan if, if it ever happens Awesome. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> any hydraulic systems in these air, in this airplane? Only on the brake. Awesome. Um, now you said you've got G five. So I normally ask some questions about your vacuum system, but given that you don't, uh, you probably don't have a vacuum system anymore. Um, yep. no vacuum system. There's no vacuum system on this at all. Nope. So what computer, right? So you've got two G fives and two then you've G5, got four thirty. Um, so the I think it's a GTX thirty one hundred. I'm not sure about it. The the transponder. Um, the uh, I think the transponder, the G four. I'm sorry, the four thirty, the two G five. That's to the best of my memory. Awesome. Well, I mean, it's, it seems like a pretty nice uh. A uh, nice panel. It's a whole lot better than my yeah. panel. I'll tell you that. Actually, uh, actually, they just yeah, they actually just installed the fuel uh, uh, digital fuel gauges, uh, digital ammeter. Uh, they did install uh, 5.0 volt um, USBs. Um, yeah, I think that's that's pretty wow. much it. 
Yeah, it's been they, a while since I flew it. That's that's why I'm a little, you know, having a little. No, hard time. I mean the fact that you know that. I mean, I know when I went through private pilot, you know, they were like, "What? What do you have?" I was like, "I got, I got, I got vacuum pumps and uh, I got Garmin 430." And they're like, "What does it do?" I was like, "No, I'm not. I'm, to be honest, I'm not really that sure." No. No, I think, I think that's, that's um, why I picked up this. This is why I picked up this plane for the check ride. It's, it's because it's the one I've been flying during these three years. It's the one I flew the most. And when awesome. I said the most, you're maybe 70 hours total. And I don't know, 60 hours total out of my whole time. So I feel All comfortable. Right. So then I'll ask, you know, you've got your, you've got your G5s, which have AHARs and ADC, um, as opposed to vacuum pumps and gyros and all that jazz. Yep. Um, what, instrumentation are you going to lose if you end up with this plugged static port what instrumentation i'm going to lose if uh, your static port gets oh. plugged um if my static port <laughs> i love that yeah uh, oh. no no let me say okay so uh the, definitely the uh the uh added uh the um uh, that uh the altimeter um and the vsi right and i think this is just about the only two uh steam gauges left in the <laughs> is the only the two steam gauges gauge. left in the plane <laughs> in the physical steam, <laughs> steam gauge configuration I'm just making this up. yeah the, oh. uh, the, the the altimeter yeah Right. So, um, the VSI, you know, if that thing gets plugged, it's gonna, it's, it's not obviously not going to work because it doesn't have any data. Um, your, yeah, your, your airspeed might function a little weird too. Yeah. Um, it's still going to work, right? Mm -hmm. We don't um, go by it anyway. So. <laughs> I'm just but, kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm just joking. So you said this thing's carbureted, right? Uh, yeah. What are you kind of susceptible to when it comes to a carburetor? Or what are some of the downsides of having a carbureted airplane versus a fuel-injected airplane? Okay. Um, carburetor is susceptible to icing at certain conditions, under certain conditions, uh, high humidity, low uh, temperatures. Um, it's also subject to um, mechanical failure, such as, you know, uh, uh, it can be stuck on or stuck off, meaning it can be stuck in the open position or in the closed position. It can, um, it's, uh, when it comes to power, you get more power from an, uh, uh, from, uh, an, an injected engine or should I say an injected, uh, fuel, uh, system than a carburetor system. Um, and reason is because the, it's an electronic versus mechanical. It's uh, two different reactions uh, time. Um, in a, um, ign uh, what do you call it? Um, it, it injection, it, injection uh, engines or inje injection systems are more, uh, can give you more power, uh, can give you, I think, um, I think the the downside of an of uh, of uh, injection system is that in hot starts you'll get a longer time to crank versus carburetor. Um, I think that's pretty much it. The majority of these issues. All right, all right. Um, I just try and clean it up a little bit, right? Um, and the only thing I asked about was what are some of the downsides of a carbureted system? You gave me a lot, right? You gave me benefits of fuel injected, benefits of you know this and that. So downsides of a carbureted system, just to clean it up. I'm susceptible to carburetor icing, more susceptible to, um, <clears throat> I can be more susceptible to mechanical failures of a carbureted system given their age. Um, mm -hmm. They're not as efficient. Got it. It's less power. There's like four things. Okay. Um, okay. You know, when we start talking more and more and giving DPEs more to work with, it gives them more questions to ask, right? You're, you're digging yourself a hole. Okay. Um, I like to use the phrase, never miss an opportunity to shut up. I was going to give you the opportunity to say it. Yeah. Um, so I love it. Um, you have a pretty good understanding of it. Um, nothing you said was wrong. You just said a lot. Um, now how would you, how would you notice carburetor icing? Um, hopefully I never have to, but if it comes to that, um, It'll probably start, uh, the, the RPM will start deteriorate. Uh, no. slightly, and gradually, they'll start, you know, slowly going down. 
you'll feel less power. You'll, you're probably, if you're in cruise, uh, your, 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 uh, empennage will start, start dropping because the, you know, the plane wants to stay up and kind of like you're starting to get the nose up, uh, uh, criteria or what, not criteria, but, uh, nose up, uh, mode. Uh, that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Now, the only thing I'd say is the carburetor icing, you're not really going to get the nose up unless you're applying back pressure, right? Unless you have autopilot. Do you have autopilot? No. No? Okay. Yeah. But, unless but, you're but applying. That's I, but that's why I said in cruise. Because your, your, your idea is just to stay up at the same altitude. But then at the same time, you start losing power. Automatically, the plane wants to start descending. Yep. You're trying, you're trying to keep it up. And that's why I said you'll start getting that nose up uh, attitude. Yep. That's awesome. what I aimed for. That's what I meant. Awesome. Um, now, how are you going to deal with that? Um, <clears throat> automatically apply carb heat. Awesome. What else could you do? Um, Descend to warmer air, right? Either descend. Yeah, probably. Well, not either. Descend to warm air. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I could just say, you know, because like, um, <clears throat> now what are you going to expect? Like you pulled that carburetor heat on. What are you expecting to happen immediately so get, after applying carburetor heat? It'll get worse before it gets better. Awesome. Awesome. And reason is it's because uh, there's three things that are going to take effect. The one, the very, the very, you know, the very um, first one I would say is uh, you're restricting airflow into the carburetor because of built of icing that's built. So that's one factor. Uh, the second thing is you're applying heat into the carburetor system, which tricks the carburetor, the carburetor to think that you are in higher altitude, which would ask it to give him less fuel. Otherwise it's going to be kind of like a, the wrong mixture. And, <clears throat> and the third thing is that eventually when all this is going to melt, you're actually melting ice into the combustion area. That thing is going to get mixed with the uh, ignition area where all the spark, spark plugs still firing, trying to, keep the engine alive. So that's, uh, that's pretty much it. And then when it's going to dissipate, when it's going to vanish, whatever you want to uh, vapor, uh, the RPM will gradually start, you know, rising back up and then you'll know that you got it all out of the system. Awesome. Awesome. Um, now do you, you've got a heater in this thing, right? Yes. All right. Is there any concerns that you might want to be aware of with that heater? Like, let's say you're flying around it's cold. You put the heater on and you start feeling a little tired. What do you think might be happening? Uh, fatigue. Well, beyond fatigue, right? <laughs> um, I forgot the term. Uh, not hypoxia. Uh, the hypoxia could be also, but um, the other one, I forgot it's the, the term. It's uh, uh, carbon monoxide uh, poisoning, I mean. Well, so carbon monoxide, you said hypoxia. Hypoxia is an appropriate uh, appropriate answer because carbon monoxide poisoning is a type of hypoxia. Right, but that's right? what I meant. Because, and, and reason I mentioned that is because really depending on the altitude you're at. If it happens at 4,000, then it's definitely not hypoxia. It's, it's a, well, it is a hypoxia, but it's carbon monoxide poisoning. And yeah. you know it's coming from the exhaust. Yeah. Meaning it's, so not, it's, meaning it's not the lack of oxygen. It's the fact that there is something else binding to your blood right. cells, not exactly. allowing you to get the oxygen exactly. that you need, right? But if you're at 9,000 feet, then it could be a combination of either or this or that. Yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> it's just carbon monoxide is a type of hypoxia, right? Uh, hypoxia, hy Hypoxic hypoxia directly related to altitude lack of pressure, right? Because your lungs function on the basis of pressure, right? If you don't okay. have the pressure, your lungs, you can't push that oxygen from your... Uh, across your lungs into your blood cells um that is hypoxic hypoxia that's that 9000 10000 feet cruising altitude making okay. you all loopy and tired um okay. <clears throat> hypemic hypoxia that is the carbon monoxide poisoning that is something else has bound to your blood cells so now there is no room for your for oxygen to bind right so hypoxia is a completely appropriate response if you know which version of hypoxia Okay. Right. So, carb so I can include carbon monoxide poisoning in the same answer, meaning I don't have to bring it up. It's just I need to define which hypoxia is it. 
Yeah, it'd be hypemic hypoxia, right? And the reason is it's 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 exhaust. It's exhaust gases, right? Because you've got a cracked uh, exhaust right. manifold, right? right? So let's get into just a. I just want to ask a couple questions about weight and balance. Not necessarily weight and balance specific to your aircraft, because like I don't have the maintenance logs. I don't have the accurate yeah, yeah, go weight ahead, and balance, go ahead. right? Yeah. Um, so, what are some concerns if I'm operating an aircraft that is the CG is too far forward? It's forward of its limits. Wow, forward, um, longer ground roll. Um, definitely, you know, you're not going to get the climb performance that you should. You're probably going to go half of it or less, uh, depending again. Um, I would say your. Uh, what about flare? Am I going to be able to flare properly? No, not exactly. No, you're, no. You're, no. For you to flare, you need to start at a thousand feet. Exactly. Well, I might not have enough. <laughs> there might not be enough uh, force applied to the tail for me to be able to do that. There was right. a there was There's a Cessna one eighty. Yeah. Yep. There was a Cessna one eighty five that uh, it was on floats, and the Cessna one eighty five is already notoriously nose heavy when you don't have it on floats. And this guy, you know, this big guy and his big old dad, they went and flew the thing around. They went to flare. He, Put the st yoke to his chest. Airplane didn't do anything. Um, one of the things I am aware of is that there are many limits to this machine, and if you treat it like a machine and not like some kind of thing, you the manufacturer says you can fly 140, you can fly 140, then then yes, yeah. yeah. And you need to understand the limitation of this machine. Well, that's how I see it. That's a wonderful segue. So let's get into our speed limitations. Uh, What's VNE? Can you describe to me what VNE is and what the appropriate speed would be for your aircraft? So VNE in the one I'm flying, since it's in a, and it's all in miles miles per hour, it's 176 uh, miles an hour, and it's the speed you can never exceed. Awesome. What's VNO? That's normal operation, and if I, if I'm right, I think it's uh, 140, uh, and you can only you cannot exceed that. Actually, you can exceed that only in smooth air. Awesome. That's normal operation, basically. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, what is, oh, I wrote down VA wrong. Um, so what is VFE? Your aircraft had two different ones. And it was based on serial number. Um, so what one's appropriate for your aircraft? The VFP on mine is the one that stands for 125 and it's for flap extended. That's the maximum flap ex extended speed. Or, or should I say the maximum speed you're allowed to use your flap? And again, it's 125 uh, miles an hour. All right. Um, what's the max weight you can take off into this thing? According to the POH, it's 2325. All right. Now you're saying according to the POH, is there something else that, you know? Yes, yes. So if you <laughs> want to hear some funny story, and I wish I had that form right here next to me. So at about a month ago, doing, you know, one of the grounds, going over some things with my instructor, he pulls up this uh, new sheet of weight and balance, and the weight and balance on it became 2450 for the max gross weight. And then he asked me about two weeks after to do another weight and balance, whatever, for some other reason. And then I'm looking at the max gross weight on the paper he gave me versus the max, max gross weight on the POA. And I'm like, okay, so what do I go by? Because the but, POA says 2325, but then this one says 2450. Then they came up with another update, and things are changing so fast. So I decided to just stick to the POH 2325. And if it increases on, you know, for whatever, whatever other reasons, it'll just be beneficial for me. That's how, that's the way I see it. Yeah. As long it, as it doesn't go below. Yeah. You'll be on the safer and, and that's the best way to do it. You're when there's new documentation coming out and stuff might seem a little, you know, ambiguous, just go for the safest option, right? Exactly. Unless there's like a supplemental type certificate sheet, you know, an STC, or something like that, allowing it. I, I don't keep up on the Piper Cherokees, you know, STCs. Um, so there could be something that uh that that's out there, right? Oh yeah, I decided to just stick to the POA, you know. Again, unless if they come up with a, another number that's below twenty three twenty five, then this is something that definitely will need to uh, to work with. <laughs> All right. So we worked through a couple emergencies. I'm just gonna we're just gonna ask a couple different more, a couple other ones. Um, you got alternator failure and um, your engine fire during start, which is awesome that you, you know, you've got those, you got them memorized. Um, this aircraft, no matter what weight <clears throat> category you're in, is not approved for spins. Right. But even with that being the case, how would you recover from one? 
I've watched too many of your videos on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Fight the rudder that uh, kick the rudder that fights you. To, well, what are you going to gonna stop, do first? Wait, 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 wait first. So, uh, power to idle, aileron neutral, uh, rudder the opposite direction of the spin, and then aileron, uh, elevator push down. Now, the idea behind all these fancy words is power to idle because the, your uh, your concept is now to try to get the nose down. You don't want to force it up. That's one. Aileron to neutral is because you don't want to induce the spin or to or a spin to a, a diff, to the other direction. Or uh, let's say make it worse than it is. So neutral yeah. on aileron. Um, the idea of the rudder, uh, and, and, and I mentioned fight, uh, kick the one that fights you is because, again, and I've never been in a spin, out of, and I hope I never will be, but to my understanding, when you're in a spin, it's hard to tell your gyros which way you're turning. So just fight whatever fights you, and yep. that's the one in your leg. So, And that's easy to find. And then uh, push the nose down, ele- elevator down, to gain uh, speed over the wing. Yep. So wing yep. that's, uh, that, that's exactly it. That is exactly uh, it. And, you know, I know everyone always teaches that, you know, just press the rudder opposite of the rotation. And I, I, what I notice is a lot of students, as soon as you ask that follow-up question of, well, which one? How do you, how do you know which one to press? And they're like, well. I agree. Well, what? 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 <laughs> one of the things that I like about what you're doing is that you're bringing the awareness, and I'm guessing out of experience, versus, you know, people who are just, you know, sitting in airplanes these days. And I see it because, I mean, I'm still one of them. And you don't get all this information. You just get the how to, how to, how to. And then once you, God forbid, enter into one of these scenarios, you, you know, your instructor is not going to be there next to you. And you're thinking, okay, now what? Yeah. So I, I, I like that. It's, it's a, an awareness. And and that's, that's, I know when I taught, you know, when I was teaching, you know, more face-to-face, more private pilot students, um, I did my best to make sure that they weren't just prepared for a check ride. And I hate seeing instructors that just like, here's the study guide. Let's go do the maneuvers and congratulations. You're a private pilot. Now I I really hate seeing that because like, I know when I got my private pilot certificate, even after 117 hours, I was still doing all kinds of dumb shit that I should never, (laughs) I I should never been doing. Right. (laughs) Cause I'm like, I'm a private pilot. I can do whatever I want. You know, I just had like, Um, you know, as long as I stay within the aircraft's limitations, I should be safe. No, 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 no. (laughs) Yeah, I say different. As long as you're still here talking, that means you know what you're doing. And that's, uh, that's the only, that's the bottom line. Yep. Yep. Um, I've only had to deal with three engine, uh, engine failures, only put one in the dirt and, uh. Wow. Okay. uh, I had my experience actually about, uh, yeah, March 4th. Okay. Uh, So what happened? Two two airplanes. uh, So I haven't flown in like, I don't know what, a month or two. And uh, that was, I was actually, I did a, a, a flight actually prior to that, I think a few days prior to that, just with my instructor to see that I'm up where I should be. And then uh, they uh, endorsed me for another solo cross country. So I'm uh, I'm done with a run up and all that. I'm re- getting ready to take off. I'm on a runway. I get my clearance and all that. And then, and then I push the throttle b- uh, forward and at about, I don't know what, six, six seven, eight, Seconds after I started running down the runway, I'm, I, I, I'm actually, I feel that I'm not getting the full power of the airplane. I, I, you know, a quick run on the on the gauges. I thought everything was good on the on the uh, oil uh, pressure, oil uh, temperature, and all that. Everything was good. But then I looked up the uh, RPM. They showed 2300, and I know it's full power. It should be at 2700. So I pulled back the power and I just canceled the uh, takeoff. Went back to the uh, went back to the school uh, uh, parking lot. Ask them to give me a different airplane. So I take <laughs> no, it's funny. I'm, I'm, taking, I'm taking my second airplane. I do the cross country. I fly Santa Monica to Santa Barbara. All that, you know, everything's fine with the flight. I come back. I want to land. Now I'm in the downwind doing 110 knots, trying to slow it down. Flap three wouldn't want to retract. Uh, not retract, sorry. That doesn't want to, you know, deploy. And I'm thinking, what the heck now? I mean, so I'm trying to figure what's the best way and how to approach this. So I decided not to stress the, not not to pu- you know to push this uh, the the lever to get the third flap, and I decided to, to just do a little higher approach uh, uh, to landing speed, and that's what I did. I actually landed it at, I don't know, at 20 miles an hour faster than the average speed that I usually do, and 
just took a longer run to stop and and I and I got it down. Yeah, I mean, no flap landings are like I know they're not to the best of my knowledge, they're not a tested event, but I mean, learning how to do them is a it's vital, right? It, my, even in my aircraft's POH, it specifically states like do not attempt, you know, water landings with no flaps. Do not attempt, you know, landings with no flaps. Um yeah. But I mean, the day that they get stuck, like I'm going to be happy that I know how to do it. Right. <laughs> They're hydraulic. I mean, all it takes is a hydraulic leak um, for me to not have any flaps. That's, that's, I think, is the name of the, the, the whole game here. What you just said, you know, if you don't ever practice it, you'll never know. Exactly. And in, my, in my case, I never practiced it. I never practiced. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, take off a board. I never did that. That's something I just had to do. And I started getting airborne with, with the first attempt. It was just my insights that just told me, yeah, you're not getting the power. You're not going to climb. And I just, boom, I pulled the power back. And with the landing thing, it's like, you know, I have to land. <laughs> with or without the flap, it's going to have to happen. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't, I don't think they're going to clear me into LAX on a 12,000 foot runway for that. So might as well take my chances here at Santa Monica and be done with it. And uh, yeah. it was great. You know, I've I've done that in the CRJ two hundred, and uh, cow. It, you definitely use fun. a lot more. You definitely use a lot more <laughs> runway. Um, I can't imagine. So, uh, do you seem to be able to handle uh, most of these emergencies pretty well? Um, let's just talk about inadvertent entry into instrument meteorological conditions, or you know, you're flying along, visibility starts to go down. Um, what are you going to do? Um, so automatically, of course, I will do a one eighty. That's that's my first reaction to try to do a 180. I'll do it in uh, uh, with the uh, one minute on the clock before I start panicking, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll put a clock. I'll do one minute uh, uh, um, coordinated turn. Um, once I'm once I'm done with the 180, I will expect to be out of the clouds within a minute or two. If that doesn't happen. Um, I will try to keep the plane on the same course, knowing that I'm heading in the direction I just came from, knowing where I'm going. Um, uh, if I can, I will try to climb maybe, uh, but, but, but not more than 500 to a thousand feet. And reason is because you can never know when that top of clouds are going to be. And automatically I will talk to, uh, to the controlling agency, uh, agency I'm with. To ask if they can, uh, you know, divert me or if they can help me find a, a VFR area, uh, notifying them that I'm a, a VFR pilot in an IMC condition. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> that is, that is it. Um, climbing, I'm not necessarily, I'd really recommend climbing because again, you're in, <clears throat> unless you're on with a controller already, um, you don't know where the traffic is, right? Oh. Not everybody's got ADSB out. Like sure, probably. I think in California, everybody's gonna have ADSB out. But, um, but I also doubt anybody's gonna be in the clouds with, with no ADSB. That. I mean, <laughs> you never know. You're right. But yeah, you you never know, right? Um, there could be another own. one. There could be another one of you out there. Somebody <laughs> out there, another <laughs> VFR pilot fun. with no, uh, um, accidentally gotten the same weather that you did. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, okay, I'm with you. You better be on the same frequency as well. So. Right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but what you just don't want to do is descend. Like climbing, yeah, you know, sure, why not? Depending on the weather, you don't want to risk getting into icing conditions <clears throat> as you continue to climb. Um, but you just definitely don't descend. I've heard some people start saying like, yeah, I'll turn around and descend. The clouds don't go all the way to the ground. I was like, are you sure? <laughs> you come, come around my park, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> You'll um, see it. No, I, I, one of the things I, I got to tell you is that I, unlike any other scenarios in life, uh, when you're up in the air and you get to a, any situation, the one thing you don't want to do is never get creative. No. Stick, stick to your, your study, stick to your learning, stick to your rules of thumb, things that you've discussed, you know, with anybody else or, you know, on the ground, when, if you ever come up on these solutions. And I think that's the learning thing that should be, uh, pass out to all these students out there because most of them will just try to do stupid stuff that you never know. Uh, mm -hmm. you know and it, it won't end up good, that's for sure. Believe so. me, some of the uh, the creative things I have seen. Is, <laughs> oh I God. can't imagine. Some of these students, it's just, it's, it's a to, lot. You need to do a video on that, you know, like a 10 seconds from each one of them for about an hour and post that. That's going to be... 
See, so I, I don't really like to do that because like, sure, the student, the student will probably recognize themselves, <laughs> but nobody else will. But again, it feels it almost feels bullying. Like I, I, I do like to use some examples, but I like to, I try to keep them really vague. Um, so that no man. student ever feels like they're being specifically targeted. Um, Cause that's I the last you, thing I want. Right. <clears throat> I know if I was on the other end of that, I wouldn't want my instructor out there talking shit about the fancy, you know, creative <laughs> stuff I was doing. <laughs> no, I agree. You, you can get it, I guess. Um, uh, <clears throat> All right, let's get into some airworthiness. What documents do you need in your airplane? Uh, <clears throat> in the airplane. So you'd need uh, the airworthiness uh, certificate. Uh, you'll need the registration, radio uh, radio uh, certificate. If you're uh, going to fly uh, internationally, the operating manual or the POH and the weight and balance. All right. Now, your aircraft, as you've already said, has G5s and it has, you know, Garmin 430 and a GTN 370 or whatever, whatever transponder is in it. Um, is that included in the aircraft's original? And it even has an STC, right? It even has the STC for the engine. Is that included in the original operator POH? No, it's going to be supplemental. Yep, so it has so. to be like, it's pretty much like when you buy a, a new device, it comes with the manual and everything else that has to be in the plane for you to to use it in case if, you know, if you ever need to, it's not yep. going to be part of the, part of the actual manual or the POH. Cause I think the POH is uh bait comes out from the factory based on a serial number. And when it comes out based on that eventually, or not eventually, but when it comes out like that, when it comes out, these devices weren't in there. So it's only supplemental. Yep. So just make sure include that, right? When the DPE asks the question, what documents do you need, right? Air the certificate registration, radio operator certificate if you're going international operator's handbook weight and balance along with any supplements like the supplement for my g5s oh. the supplement for my garments and the supplement for my transponder right these are all things okay. that weren't installed from the factory like <clears throat> um <clears throat> you know because even again personally in my airplane um what was it what's in it that wasn't installed originally attitude uh, indicator much. yeah <laughs> um <laughs> Oh no, I, yeah. Uh, well, no, I've got my, I've got vortex generators. I've got all kinds of other weird stuff on the That's outside. Nice. Oh, they're, they're, I love them. I love them. I've, I've gotten yeeted off the water by some jet skis sometime, a couple different times, like cutting me off when I'm trying to land on the water. And oh, really? yeah. And to be honest, like, I don't um, get, this, I don't get it. Like they see an airplane trying to land and they're like, I'm gonna go look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta ask you this. So what was your, uh, what was your, and I'm guessing VSO, what was your VSO before you installed it? Um, so I'm trying to remember. I think the VSO, the stall speed, that the published stall speed before them was 53. The STC doesn't specifically call out a lower stall speed. Um, they won't. But no, it, it didn't specifically say it, but I know I've had the thing flying at 38. Wow. <laughs> so. Wow. You can um, almost hover, man. <laughs> you can almost hover. Yeah, yeah, it, it was... <laughs> Um, and that's the thing is like when, um, that jet ski incident, uh, when it pumped me, when it bumped me back up off the water, I was probably still in ground effect or water effect. So calling it 38 might be a little pre might be a little low, um, from what it would be in like still yeah, smooth the, the, air, the, but the idea, the idea that you could have gone lower be below your VSO, you know, and confidently knowing that you're going to be able to. Yeah, and it was it was more about lateral control that that the those vortex generators really offered me. Um, sure, I've got big ailerons and, and everything, but the fact that it stole or it, it didn't stall, but the fact that it maintained just a flat climb out, like it was. Oh and, my god! And you 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 got a cub, right? No, I have a Lake Two Hundred. I I don't know what a Lake Two Hundred. Oh, here I'll, I'll just cub. yeah, no, yeah, I just I'll thought just you had a cub. I don't no, know I no like here, I'll, I'll just pull it up. Now, now that you're saying it, that's even even a, a bigger wow. Because I know the Cubs, they'll, you know, everybody knows they can go very slow, but. Yeah, that's like what they're designed for. Uh, yeah, yeah, but if you're screen. saying your VSO was about 58, or what is it, like the Piper type size kind of airplane? Uh, so here it is. Um, you know, oh, this is the lakes. Uh, oh, nice. Right. It's a, uh, what do you call it? The. Uh, the flying boat. Yeah, yeah, but they, uh, they actually got the term anyway. But, yeah. Wow, no, that's I, a cool one, man. Yeah, this one's mine. 
That is really cool. Um, but yeah, you can see the vortex generators all along the leading edge. And it's not just vortex generators on the leading edge. They got them on the flaps too. <laughs> what um, was that thing on top of it? Is that the engine? Yeah, yeah that's, that's the, the engine. engine. Yeah. Keeps it out of the water. <laughs> yeah. Because it no, lands it on the on the bo- on the belly. <clears throat> right. And the uh, uh, landing gear is, re- is retracted or is it? Yep. Yeah, see. Man, that is so cool. You can even you can even beach the thing. What's the top speed of it? Uh, I cruise at like one fifteen. That's pretty fast. Yeah, I, I mean, mean with, all, with all these drag you got on it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. I know it's um. Yeah, I mean, I cruise at like one fifteen, burning ten an hour, so it's not great. I think you're <laughs> just about where we at. Oh, you're just about where we at. Yep. Um. <clears throat> So continuing on, right? Um, if you were to grab that logbook, right? The maintenance logbook of your aircraft, what are you going to be looking for in that maintenance logbook to verify that, well, the aircraft's still airworthy? Uh, that all airworthiness directives have been uh, serviced. Uh, see, I, I'll be looking for more. The more, the, the more, the, the ones I'll put my attention on, on is going to be the reoccurring ones. Because uh, the one that comes out, you know, because of whatever, how you know, someone find, found something and, you know, decided to put an airworthiness directive out there. Uh, but the reoccurring ones, those are the ones that usually have consistent uh, consistency in e- and issues. So th- that's why they're reoccurring. Uh, I'm going to be looking for those. I'm going to be looking for, uh, uh, along with that, I'm going to be looking for uh, the work. Uh, how do you say it? the The... Uh, the stickers, you know, the, the, the mechanic stickers showing that they were, uh, there was, uh, the, the repairs or, uh, maintenance that should be done on the aircraft is all there. Um, I'm going to be looking for, um, <clears throat> I'm going to be looking for the, okay. So we're talking the airworthiness directive. We're talking, um, sorry, I'm just a little lost for a second. Um, Airworthiness directive is that's pretty much what I'm going to be looking for. Okay. Um, so is there, what are the required inspections? What are the required inspections required and maintenance? Are annual VOR every 30 days. Well, annual every 12 months, both calendar, calendar months, uh, VOR every 30 days, uh, 100 hours, um, Altimeter Peter static system every 24 calendar months, transponder every 24 calendar months, and the ELT every 12 months with uh, either one half of the battery life uh, consumed uh, or um, or for unknown amount of time or unknown amount of time used or unknown amount of time on. Yep. So it's not, it's not half the battery's uh, life consumed. It's half the battery's like uh, advertised life. life, right? So okay. here, let me, let me grab a nine volt battery, right? If I look at this nine volt battery, uh, mm-hmm. it says that it expires March of 2027. All right. So if I bought this in March of 2025, I would have to replace this in March of 2026. Right. If it was an ELT battery. Okay. Uh, It's not that the batteries like used half. It's not 50% on my phone kind of thing. Right. Um, So so half, half the battery useful life. Yep. Half the battery's useful life. Right. Okay. Um, I don't know why half, right? If if I had a if I had a nine volt battery in my ELT, I'd probably want to replace that every year, whether or not the nine volt battery was good till twenty twenty seven, or you know, it's a nine volt battery. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, and all of those things are going to be in the the maintenance log. Have you ever seen a maintenance log for yeah. your aircraft? Right, they're yeah. they're pretty cumbersome and mm-hmm. you're kind of a disaster. If we're gonna be, yep. if we're gonna no, be honest. Sure. I, I can tell you the funniest thing. I'm pre check right now. You know, with about with a check right right around the corner. And I just found two days ago that the plane I'm going to take the check ride has an annual signed by an AMP and not by an IA. So now the school decided to send it back to the same shop to get an IA, take a look at it. And because of this whole noise that's going around it now, they decided to do a full blown annual on it. I mean, yeah, that, that kind of like, I, I think that's what I would rather, you know, think about the, you know, you're flying the thing, right? I'd rather the person who's qualified doing it. And I help with all of my annuals too. So you know, if you get the opportunity, yeah, the truth, it's worth it. The truth is that if you were, okay, and I, and I saw the sticker for the 100 hours, it was, I think, uh, January 31st. 
So you're talking less than two months ago. But then you think about it. If they were to just say, okay, let's get the same mechanic to give us or whatever the the bar, you know, the IA one is, just to trust that mechanic and give us the IA uh, signature on it. Imagine the Pandora box you just opened. Exactly. Like if something happens, right? Exactly. Um, So. Now, your aircraft, right, it's being used, you know, it's being used for a flight school, right? So it requires that 100-hour inspection. Let's say you and a buddy go buy an airplane, right? And your buddy wants to receive um, instruction in that airplane. Does that airplane still need a 100-hour inspection? Okay, so we're buying it, me and him? Yeah, you and and your kid, you and your buddy, you and, you know, anybody, right? Y'all go buy an airplane. No, 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 you don't Right. The truth, the truth to say, and that's the sad truth, is that you don't need nothing if it's yours. You only well, need it if anybody ever asks for it. And we're talking. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I, I obviously can't recommend you. that, right? <laughs> um, it's like they say, you only need, only need a license when you get caught, right? <laughs> obviously, I cannot recommend you know <laughs> avoiding know. the required <laughs> maintenance on an aircraft, but. Um, okay. yeah, since you guys own the airplane and you're going and getting an instructor from the outside, um, then you don't need that hundred hour inspection. Right. right? Um, now your aircraft, right. It's got those G fives. Um, but it still has pretty much all the backup standbys, right? It, it still has all the steam gauges. The only thing that was uh, honestly yeah. replaced was an attitude indicator, oh. right? Y'all took out the attitude indicator and the heading indicator to replace yeah, it much. with G fives. Let's Pretty say those so. both of those G5s are dead. Is this aircraft still airworthy? Uh, yes. It's, yeah. Uh, I think if you go to the 91205, it doesn't say you need to have G5s. <laughs> well, so it's not necessarily about G5s, right? Like but, we look at look at what instrumentation is available still to us, right? right? right. So if we lose both of our G5s, the attitude indicator is the the best one is right over the uh, dashboard to start yep. with that. Yep. Um. And again, as long as you're a VFR, you know, you should, you have all the, all, all, all the tools you have uh, are out there in front of you. You just need to use them. All right. Now let's say that there's just a, another piece of equipment that's broken. Like I, I, to be honest, I can't even think of one specifically for your aircraft. Um, but let's just say there's another item on your aircraft that is broken. Where are you going to, comp- what are all the, the, the references that you're going to go look well, through? So, so I'm going to start with uh, uh, 91213 uh, to see what is required on this thing to be airworthy to start. Not to not to be airworthy. Yeah, if I may say, yes, yeah, to be airworthy, uh, and that will reference me probably down to 91205, and I'll start with that. Look through the whole list, whatever day, night time, depending. You know, I'm going to look into that. Um, after that, I'm going to look in. Uh, that's it, actually. That's it. Yeah, two, uh, 91213 should tell you pretty much everything on it. Yep. So what is 91213 telling you to check, right? 91213 tells you to check 91205. What are the other items in 91213? That's a good question. I need to look it up again. <laughs> All right. So airworthiness <laughs> directives, type certificate data sheet, uh, supplemental type certificates, and kind of operation equipment list, right? Which um, we don't have, yes. Yeah, most both and MEL if your aircraft does have an MEL. Not, right? not, 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 we don't have that one either. <laughs> um. So airworthiness directives, right? Your aircraft has some airworthiness directives. Every aircraft, yeah. every, uh, there ain't no damn airplane I, out there that doesn't have an airworthiness I, directive. I, I, I think to answer that, you can start pulling, you, you go, you pull the TCDS, and that'll tell you pretty much, uh, you know, everything that this aircraft should have. Yep. Along with 91213, you just need to confirm that it has it. Along with 91205, to be sure that none of that is missing, and if you, if everything is in order, yep. you're most likely that you're 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 legit. Yep. The only thing is just make sure STCs. A lot of students forget STCs, especially since you've got a new engine. Um, in yours, uh, there could be other items that are necessary. Um, I'm trying to think of my STCs because I've got the vortex generators, the bat wings, uh, the new heater. The new cargo door, right? I guess with the new cargo door, right? Um, <clears throat> if the latch, obviously, if the door handle for that cargo door doesn't work, well, it's not in 91205. It's not in this. It's not in that. It's but in it's my supplemental issue. type certificate that that door handle has to work, right? Okay. So just don't yeah. forget STCs, right? Okay. Um, let's get into some regulations. 
what can you do now? Well, you get your private pilot certificate. Congratulations, right? <laughs> what are you now allowed to do? So I'm allowed to fly uh, friends. Um, I'm allowed to fly for charity. I'm allowed to uh, do pretty much everything I want, except for uh, you know for for being hired, uh, or should I, you know, except for use the license for a job, if I may call it this way, on the simplest uh, way. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I yeah. mean, there's, there's very, yeah, you can do many things as long as you don't get compensated for those things, as long as, as, long as you don't turn yourself into a taxi <laughs> type services thing, as long as you, you know, you keep your, uh, forgot what it's called, but, um, as long as you don't uh, uh, push yourself into situations where you you kind of like looking to fly. So yes, it happened and let's go fly. Then you should be fine. Yeah. Now, and, and that's a great way to put it, right? As long as you're not out here like, yo, how can I get some hours? What do I need to do to go and get some hours, right? Um, right. What a lot of, a very common thing that people do with their cars, right? So they'll drive somebody to the airport and people will pay them for gas, right? Yeah. Now, if you own your own airplane, this seems like a reasonable thing to do with your own aircraft. Fly someone from where they're at mm -hmm. to another airport so that they can, you know, go get on their their big airliner. And they're going to give you 50 bucks for gas. Is that okay? No. No, because it's compensation, right? And you, you don't have a common yourself... purpose. That's, right. You don't have a common purpose. That's, that's the, the big deal, thing. right? Um, <clears throat> now, if you're both flying to, you know, whatever airport to go hop on an airliner flight That's fair game purpose. yeah right me and my me and my wife have done that like we have flown our airplane to another airport to then go hop on an airliner with her flight benefits yep. <laughs> out oh, of yeah, our no, that, that is completely fine purpose yeah right um is there any airspace even as a private pilot nothing else just a private <clears throat> pilot that you can't go into alpha alpha where does alpha and start restrict, and restrict and uh, prohibited i'm sorry Yes, alpha and prohibited. <laughs> yep, I guess prohibited <laughs> is included in that. Good catch. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but I got, but I got to ask you something. I never thought I would have to. So it's kind of tricky thing, but because alpha is only and and to my and humble opinion is only in the United States. It starts at eighteen thousand. I haven't even checked out. It doesn't matter. But say you're in a terrain area, say in the Himalayas. And the alpha starts at twenty six thousand. I don't know at twenty seven thousand. So how does that work there? Uh, to be honest, I'm I'm not sure. I haven't flown <laughs> in the Himalayas. <laughs> oh, but do you see where I'm, where I'm yeah. going with it? I, I I get what you're saying. If I remember correctly, there is a. What I'm trying to say is that you know if your uh, if your AGL is less than eighteen thousand, but alpha is in that AGL, how does that work? Anyway, I think um, we're just yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean that again, yeah. you know, like Alpha just does only <laughs> exist in the United States, and there are no mountains in the United States that would punch into Alpha. There I is, was trying to... but not in the continental uh, United States. It's actually Mount uh, in Alaska. It's Mount uh, McKinley. I think it's at twenty. What is it? Twenty eight thousand. Yeah, you know what? But, I need to look I, that up then. But I'm... but but I don't know the airspace in in Alaska, and that's why I'm just. Saying. So from a from a mountainous terrain, Mount McKinley is the highest, you know, in the United States because it's United States terrain, okay, or yeah. uh, same territory. And Alpha starts at eighteen thousand, so I just need to check on Alaska. Yeah, yeah I need. I'm I'm definitely gonna. I, mean, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, because that yeah. I, to be honest, I've never thought of that because I've never and, and I and I never thought about it until actually now when you mentioned that in the United States, and I was thinking, wait a minute, and you get where I'm going, so. Oh, shit. Definitely an interesting point to check. I'm going to look into it uh, myself. Because <clears throat> I know the highest point in the continental U.S., I think, I think it's, um, I don't know if it's Mount St. Helen in Washington. <clears throat> it might be. It's up at 14,000, isn't it? Probably, yeah. But around, yeah, if it's around 14,000, there's many, uh, well, not many, but there's at least four or five peaks that I can think of around that same altitude, but that's still, again, below alpha. All right. <clears throat> so 
You can now go into Bravo airspace. Can you describe to me what a clearance into Bravo airspace sounds like? Yeah. So, uh, whatever LA, LA, uh, center, uh, fine. One, two, three, four, uh, Cherokee, one, two, three, four, uh, like to transition your airspace? Like to transition your airspace, requesting permission into the Bravo. All right. <clears throat> and so, then they would have to say, I'm, okay, you go ahead. I'll let you do your part. Oh, no, no. I was just asking, you know, what, um, you know, uh, what would you expect to hear back to know that you are cleared into the Bravo? Whatever, whatever, uh, whatever clearance they will issue me, uh, it has to be followed by the word, uh, you are cleared into the Bravo. Awesome. Awesome. If it hasn't had, if it didn't, if they didn't give you this portion of the clearance, whatever it is, you are still not allowed into the Bravo. All <laughs> right. So let's say, congratulations, you got cleared into the Bravo. What kind of VFR do you need to maintain? Right. Cause they're going to tell you, you know, maintain VFR cleared into the Bravo via such and such transition. Three miles. You mean as far as visibility and cloud clearance? So yep. a three, three second miles clear of cloud. Awesome. <clears throat> now, Let's say you're at a Delta airport. It's like two mile visibility with 2000 foot ceilings. Is there any way that you could leave that airport? You can ask for a special VFR if, uh, if the airport allows it. Um, and I would say, yeah, you, you can use a special VFR rule, but know that if it gets worse above what you're planning, you'll need to land in that same condition. So I think you might want to reconsider that before you do it especially yeah. when you're a new pilot <clears throat> that's it's definitely now can you do this at night yep if you're ifr and if you're you not haven't <laughs> if you're if you got ifr rating <clears throat> awesome so uh let's get into some aerodynamics i normally ask what a flaps do for us but given that you've already landed without <laughs> them I'm, I'm assuming you got a pretty good understanding of what flaps do for let's you let's just say for the record it's not needed for what you for this portion of the flight <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So can you describe to me uh, what happens during a stall? Um, so a stall. So a stall is basically uh, the angle of the, uh, the airfoil has achieved the critical angle of attack, meaning between the airfoil and the relative wind. All right. And what happens at that critical angle of attack? The air above the uh, uh, above the airfoil top portion, the camber, separates from the lower portion, and there's because there's no attachment on the backside of it, you lose lift. You awesome. don't generate lift. All right. Now, talking about lift, what are the two different principles uh, in regards to the generation of lift that are covered in the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge? I know a bunch of people get in the comments of these things, going, well, "What about all these <laughs> other ones?" <laughs> Uh, so, uh, generating of lift is on the basis of the principles, uh, written by, uh, Einstein, uh, third law of, uh, <laughs> oh, well, it's Newton, not Einstein. N Newton, I'm sorry, not <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah, I was like, mm, well, I guess, but like Einstein so was I, a little I, more. I, Einstein wrote it, wrote it. <laughs> so, uh, Newton's third <clears throat> law and, uh, Bernoulli's principle. Okay. Uh, Bernoulli's principles is basically saying that when you constrict a certain uh, liquid into a tube or anything, uh, it will uh, it will generate speed, which will decrease pressure. Right. That's yeah. I wouldn't necessarily say. I, I would try to pull that kind of tube portion out of it because is our wing a tube? Okay. No, our no, wing's not no a tube. tube, right? No tube. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so it's it's when. Uh, what Bernoulli's I, I, principle? I was gonna, I was gonna say through a uh, bottleneck. Well, yeah. So what Bernoulli's principle really states is that um, when you, when the velocity of a fluid increases, its internal pressure drops. That's that's really what Bernoulli's principle states. But when you cause that restriction, it needs to accelerate for the same mass entering the system to equal the same mass exiting the system. Right. No, I need Einstein next to me. <laughs> <laughs> what did you just say? Well, so what it's saying <laughs> is that... Kidding. Yeah, no, no, I got you. <clears throat> right? Um, and that's why we get that drop in pressure. It's less about the tube. It's more about when a fluid meets a restriction, its velocity has to increase, which causes okay. a drop of that fluid's internal pressure. 
which is why we get that separation of high and low pressure, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then Newton's third law, that one's pretty straightforward, right? For every, every action, reaction, there's an opposite reaction. Awesome, awesome. Now, <laughs> what are the two different types of drag? Parasite and induced. All right. What is uh, induced drag? By uh, Byproduct of lift. There's a byproduct of lift, right? Uh, and parasitic drag? Rivet. Uh, flat anything that is outside the the flat port the the, the flat areas I'm gonna say or the well, smooth areas. yeah it's anything that would disrupt the smooth laminar flow right pretty much yeah and so that's why a bunch of brand new airplanes are being made out of composite and they're super super uh super smooth right yep. look at a Cirrus right yeah you know, ain't no rivets to be found anywhere on a Cirrus yeah <laughs> that's true yeah all right so what <laughs> would happen um if we were to stall this aircraft in an uncoordinated fashion, or what if are we, we risking? Stall, uh, spin. Yep. So we, we, we could possibly enter a uh, spin. Can you, do you know the four phases of a spin? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Entering CPN fully developed and uh, recover or recovery. Right. How do we recover from a spin? Oh, we already talked about that one. Yep, ah. We already brought that one up. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> So can you talk to me about adverse yaw? Like what causes adverse yaw? So adverse yaw is a byproduct of uncoordinated uh, flight. And in, uh, in simple words to say, it is when your tail doesn't chase your nose in the same direction, you're causing drag. That drag is coming from one wing, which is usually going to be the higher wing. Uh, actually, no, there's no... There's, I don't think I should go there because it's nothing. It, it, it's got a little bit of it, but it's not related to what we just saw. Yeah. It's a different issue. Yeah. It's a different. Issue. Yeah. So I think, I feel like you, you went a little bit more into like, you know, the uncoordination, the stalling, right? So adverse y'all, what causes <clears throat> adverse y'all? The generation of lift on the outside wing. Right. That's it. That is the end of the answer, right? Remember, yep. anytime a DPE asks you a question, you answer that question. Like, do you know what time it is? Yes. yes. <laughs> <clears throat> I need to I need to put that on a t-shirt. DPE asks, "Do you know what time it is?" Yes. I think it's going to be a good t-shirt to sell, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> right. So it's more of that generation of lift and then once we get into like a fully established turn, right? When we have that outside wing spinning or moving faster since it moves faster, it's um generating drag. It generates more drag. Yeah. which again can cause you a little bit of adverse yaw, right? right? I know I've done some adverse yaw exercises in a glider and you can get to like, it's ridiculous, like 60 degrees of yaw just by using aileron. It, it's because, it, wow. yeah, you go to bank over and it does like this. It's wow. Yeah, they are. Wow. It is. It is. Yeah, nuts. They got, they got the kind of wings like a freaking U2, man. These things are so long. It's like, yes. Oh my God. Massive. Um, <clears throat> so what are the turning tendencies that are talked about in the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge? Uh, turning tendencies, uh, <clears throat> B factor torque and a spiral slipstream and, uh, I got it. I got it. I got it. Uh, <laughs> and gyroscopic precession, gyroscopic precession, right? Can you describe to me? Yeah, can yeah. you describe to me what causes P-factor? So the ascending blade is biting more air than the the ascending blade, or it's called asymmetric uh, propeller chewing, I would call it. Asymmetric propeller loading, asymmetric <laughs> loading. propeller thrust, yeah. yeah. Um, right, it's the descending blade is generating more lift than the ascending blade, right? Because uh, right. it's got a greater angle of attack to the relative wind. Right. Right. Um, <clears throat> now... You've got, um, I, we're going to get into a little bit of a navigation, right? And I saw your, your cross country plan and I see that every bit of it is GPS. So with that being the yes. case, let's talk about GPS. How does GPS yeah. work? Wait, 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 wait. There's okay. one thing about this one I sent you because I didn't have the time to prepare a, uh, a manual nav log or whatever, you know, paper nav log. Okay. But if, if you also look at that nav log, check out the headwind. This is uh, this is one flight I would never do. <laughs> yeah, I saw that there was a there was an average of like twenty seven um, knot headwind or something like that. Yeah, and, crazy and, wind. Yeah, and I get that, and that's the thing. If you don't want to go over nav log, if you feel comfortable wor working no, a whiz wheel, and yeah, 
Um, I'm good. <clears throat> I'm good. I'm good. Um, you saying you're good? You don't really want to cover cross country procedures? No, I'm saying yeah. Let's go. Oh, yeah. Let's all right, it. let's yeah. dig into it. Awesome. Open awesome. it up. Awesome. Show, show me, show me the things on the GPS I didn't know because I'm gonna need to know them. So yeah. Well, let's go ahead. It's not just that you didn't know. It's just that, you know, when I see a student that's really, that uses only GPS waypoints, it's like, okay, uh, one of two things is happening. They're either not comfortable with ground-based navigation or they're not comfortable with using, you know, no, actual waypoints. Oh, no, I'm just going to admit it that, you know, full-blown screen, I got lazy, yes. Uh, and that's the other option. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always say, you know, it's okay to get lazy as long as you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing and you follow what you think you know you're doing, you're going to find yourself going in the wrong direction. Yeah. And complacency is, is definitely, you know, yeah, you don't, let, you don't want to fall susceptible to complacency. I've, I know uh, I've definitely like, you know, everybody's fallen victim to complacency uh, every once in a while. Um, point of convenience. Yeah. Point of convenience. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I do see here, I'll share my screen real quick just so you yeah, can see what I'm see staring at. You're gonna, yeah, because I was going to pull this off. I mean, to pull it out of my bag. So you're seeing your nav log right here, correct? Yep. Can you read it? Yeah, I think I'm good. Yeah, I, I can read it. Yep. All right. Yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. <clears> now, good I want to bring up this right here. Uh, okay. Rain. Given that you okay. are using GPS as the sole form of navigation on this nav log, what is RAIN? So I know what is, what is RAIN. I don't know nothing about how to use it. All I know is that as long as it shows green, it means you will not have GPS outages. That's, but that's... RAIN, yeah, RAIN stands for... Uh, uh, um, it's a... I forgot. Uh, RAIN stands for autonomous something recovery. Never mind. Receiver? I forgot autonomous? Receiver autonomous in, in... Nah, you got me. Receiver autonomous, autonomous integrity monitoring. Monitoring, yeah. Yep. It's kind <clears> of like a system that monitors the GPS and it tells you that if there's going to be any outages, you'll see it here. Uh, it's not... It's... It's instrument. Uh, <laughs> okay. We're getting yeah. into instrument level. What yeah, I really yeah. just wanted to make sure you knew is if you were going to use GPS as a sole form of navigation um, on a GPS, that's that's more than approved to be used as a sole form of navigation that you know what it looks like when it's wrong. Right. I, I don't yeah. care that, you know, that you need six <laughs> satellites, seven satellites. What, you know, are you going to get a vertical? Are you going to get VNAV? Cause you're not going to be using VNAV, right? You're not going right, to be using right, right you know, any of this stuff, but you know what, what wrong looks like. That's, that's really yep. the big takeaway. All right. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and I see that you've got, where's your fuel burn? <clears throat> Extra fuel, landing fuel. So I see you've got a reserve fuel of 6.7. What is that based on? Um, that's based on the POH. Okay, so it's based uh, on, on your fuel burn from the POH. You're fuel right. Fuel burn from the POH, yes. So why do I need 6.7 and not 8? Or why can't I land with 1? So that's a mandatory. That's a 30 minutes uh, VFR mandatory for day and uh, 45 minutes for night, if there was. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> so you are well aware that you need 45 minutes of extra gas, or 30 minutes of extra gas. Um, for daytime. For daytime, right? What's this alternate for? I'm seeing so, that you put an alternate in here. Right. And I think it's uh, GS. Okay. Okay. So you've got this one right here. It's SBP. Yeah. SBP. SBP. Um, awesome. And for whatever 4.6, whatever gallons that it did say, that's the distance from the, from the uh, destination uh, airport to this airport. All right. Based, based on the wind altitude and it's all, you know, got it configured to this much of fuel consumption that would be needed for that portion of the flight. All right. My last question is wh what website are you using for this? For flight. Oh, this is for flight. You can print this out of for flight. Oh yeah. Oh, I, I use Garmin pilot. So I, I haven't used for flight in years. Um, okay. So yeah, you can, you can pretty much get the nav log out of for flight and you can physically print it into a piece of paper. Um, oh. 
Yeah, and then and, and I always do that to have that as a backup because you know these devices they get warmed up in this uh, non AC plane. So. <laughs> oh, believe me, I am I am well aware of that. When I flew my airplane home, by the time I taxied from the the hangar that it was parked in to the runway, all of my electronics had shut down due to heat. Wow. I was about to shut down due to heat. <laughs> no, I can't listen. You know, so you've been there, you know it. Uh, one more thing, one more reason why I always print it when I go to this flight is because uh, if I were to be tested on uh, red uh, dead reckoning, then I would just throw the iPad back because I'm not going to try to do dead reckoning with a piece of uh, half a whatever half a pound equipment sitting on my lap trying to figure you know how much time and no, just easier to look at the the the, the chart when you're holding it and and just run the 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 the, the clock. <clears throat> Yeah, and I mean, a lot of people, at least what my what my first instructor told me is about three fingers is about 10 miles on a sectional. Right? As long as you're uh, holding the sectional. But yeah, as long as you've got the sectional in your hand, like if you've got the paper chart in your hand, about three fingers held yeah. on the chart um, is about 10 miles. Now, for some people that got fatter fingers or thinner fingers or what have you, obviously that's going to be a little, you know, but if you're – you're using that in the event of a diversion, right? You're not using yeah. that in the event that um... secondary. That's that's a secondary mean. If if we're talking about the idea of having the printed the uh, uh, the printed portion or the printed uh, version. Oh, it didn't save your flight plan. That's frustrating. You need it? I, I can. No, I just I put it in. I put it <clears> into Sky Vector at one point. Um, but here I'll share my screen and we're going to start going over airspace just to make sure oh, if you want, I can give you the waypoint. It's very, uh, I don't know. Oh no, it's, it's not a big deal. You're, I looked through your, I looked through your route and it, it's, it's straightforward. There's not really a whole lot going on there. Yeah. Um, it's not a desert. There's mountains and desert. Yeah, exactly. So <clears throat> I'm just going to go around your area. Uh, okay. what airspace is this? Charlie. That's uh, Charlie airspace. So if I am on the ground here. Surface what to else? 44, surface to 4,400 is where it starts. Out here? No, no, in the inside circle. It starts no, 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 I'm asking out here. Oh, 1,600. Awesome, Starting awesome. Starting at 1,600 up to 4,400. All right. Um, why is this blue with dots as opposed to this over here? Dried out river? If I have Sometimes to water. Sometimes water? Yep. Uh, it's not always going to be dry. It's not always going to be wet. Sometimes water. Now, again, most of these, especially, you know, in the current day and age, this sometimes water is now turning into no times water. Yeah. When in California, everything what was no, no, no water at all. And is now all water now. I know it's, it's kind of a lot, right? <laughs> Weather is changing my friend. Yeah. Um, what is this right here? Uh, an MOA. Military right, can, operation area. Can I go in this? Yeah, you can. You just need to talk to the uh, agency, the uh, the controlling agency, to see if it's hot, if it's cold. Uh, and as a general rule of thumb, I can tell you that flying VFR, I would plan around it. There's no need to get into these places because it's for military. So you know, let them do their thing. Yeah, you know, I out I mean, in Wisconsin, you... the MOAs are a lot bigger. Um, they're kind of hard to avoid. Uh, is there anything barring me from entering this MOA if I don't talk to anybody? You're saying if there's anything barring you from entering if you don't talk to anyone? Yeah, if I just take off from here and I just want to fly to here. Is there oh. is there any requirement, any legal requirement for me to talk to anybody while I punch through this MOA? Well, that's a good question. No. No, no, there. It doesn't matter so, if they're hot, cold, what have you. Use caution is the 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 recommendation, right? Use extreme caution anywhere where there's going to be live rounds. You're going to see um, a different kind of airspace, um, and generally, you're going to see them right. inside of another MOA. Okay, um, it's going to be I restricted know, airspace. Yeah, I think I know one because we have Point Magoo right at the right at, right in our backyard. So. <clears throat> If you know Point Magoo, no, I'm I'm, okay. I'm not sure what it is. Yeah, uh, it's another military <laughs> base. Yeah, it's a, a U.S. naval base. Right. 
Um, but, but, but I get the point. Yeah. So if it's, uh, if it's, uh, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Restricted. Right. So we've got a Inside MOA. The There's nothing yeah. stopping me from going into this MOA. Right. This mm -hmm. is where you're going to see a lot of live rounds and stuff. Right. Okay. Because they're, that's why it's restricted. They don't want anybody getting shot while they're out there practicing. Okay. Uh, what is, what is this? Well, that's an, uh, uh, an IFR uh, military route. Awesome. Should I use those for like my own navigation? You can, well, no, you're gonna, you should expect in you know, a jet flying at 250 knots in excess of 250 knots or, you know, and, and you, you want to stay, you can, you can fly parallel to them within a certain distance, but you don't want to fly on them. You don't yeah, want to use them like Victor Airways. Yeah, just yeah. just stay away from them, right? Yeah, What's this airspace? So that is an echo starting at the surface. All right, up to eighteen thousand alpha. Oh, awesome, awesome. Why is this black? That looks like it's like from a, a t that looks like it's from like a Bravo, but it's black as opposed to blue. What is it? Black. I'm sorry. What are you talking about? I, these I, letter, I, these these right here, the hundred to oh. surface. Oh, that's a good question. Why is it black? Is it a Tursa? It is a Tursa. Uh, oh, yeah, Palm Spring. There you go. Yeah, it <laughs> no, is a but Tursa. I, I, but I didn't know the, the writings are going to be in uh, black, uh, in, in a different color. That's yep. Weird. Um, what is a Tursa? What does it provide? Uh, it's a, a Tursa is basically uh, an airspace equivalent to a Charlie procedure. As far as uh, talking to a controlling, uh, what do you call it, an approach, an approach control, in order to uh, get clearance to enter or land at you know whatever airport they're above or in or around, and that's basically the simplest way to put it is basically just the idea of uh, flying into a, a Charlie air airspace without the obligation to use it. You don't have to talk to them. Awesome. That was, cause that was my follow-up question. Cause you said something about getting a clearance to land there. And I'm like, Oh, no, but no. look, there's a uncontrolled airport inside the Tursa. Right. Right. right? No, I said um, the idea of like flying into a Charlie, it's like, you know, because of the control and because of the uh, approach control, you know, it would be smart to talk to them so that they can line you with the rest of the traffic coming in and out of the airport. So, you don't, so they don't end up putting you at uh, your number 100 behind the Cessna that's 50 miles out. So. Yep. Now, um, we've got two uncontrolled airports right here. You see them? Yes. All right. Why is this one filled in and this one's empty? Uh, so one is hard surface snow landing. The other is uh, probably grass landing. Uh, it's no de no defined hard surface intended for landing. Uh, that's what it okay. means. Could be grass, could be dirt, could be gravel. Um, okay. You know, it could be a number of things. You could look at the AFD to figure out exactly what it is, right? Right, yeah. Um, so I do see, again, you're using GPS, so, and you're using some nav aids, right? Pretty much, yeah. <clears throat> How do I know if this nav aid works? So you tune to that 116.1, and you turn up the volume on the, on the, on the, uh, nav uh radio to listen to the morse code that is assigned with this uh channel now if i don't hear the morse code but i'm morse getting code. a signal anyway is this thing working i wouldn't trust it nope that morse code is letting you know that it works okay uh yeah. even if you're getting a signal there's no guarantee that that signal is correct right okay um <clears throat> So here's Bravo airspace, right? This is Vegas. Okay. Inside this purple ring, what equipment do I need? Uh, mode C veil. Yep. Um, which is a uh, transponder with a recording altitude, if I'm right. Yep. And, and, then a, and a two way radio. One more piece of equipment um, ADSB out. ADSB out. There is no requirement for a two way radio. Um, um ooh, ooh, wait a minute. I might have to check that one, actually. In a Bravo? In a Bravo, yes. Under the Mode C Veil, no. No, under the Mode C Veil, no. You said in the Bravo. You said this. Oh, okay, sorry. No. 
Sorry. Oh, my bad. Maybe I, maybe yeah. I didn't, maybe I thought you said you did. Let's say I'm down here. I'm outside That's the mode cool. C veil, right? Outside the yep. mode C veil yep. at 6,000 feet. What equipment do I need? At 6,000 feet? Um, no, you're in the Bravo. You need to, uh, you need mm -hmm. the transponder and report, uh, transponder with the reporting uh, altitude and two way radio. Now, if am I in the Bravo at 6,000 feet? Yeah, because it's 75 to 1, uh, 75. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're below the Bravo. I'm sorry, my bad. Yeah, so I'm below the Bravo, but you are correct. You do still need that equipment because it's not just within the mode C veil. It's also within the lateral boundaries of Bravo. Okay. All right. A lot of people miss that one, that it includes the lateral boundaries of Bravo. Uh, Let's just say for the sake of all the students out there, if you ever get yourself into that kind of an airspace without a radio or a transponder, I would suggest take a gun and shoot yourself. Well, you're about to hit something. <laughs> That's not even that big of a deal because let's go, let's go here. This is where I did 90% of my training out of, right? I did 90% of my training out of okay. here. Okay. All right. But there's this little airport right here, Casa Grande Municipal. Okay. It's a, it's an uncontrolled airport. There's a bunch of people there with like pipers and cubs and all this other jazz, right? No, okay. ain't nothing really all that fancy going on there. Um, but there's this little sliver of Bravo that sticks out outside the mode C veil, requiring you to have that piece of equipment, requiring you to have the ADSB out and the transponder of, with mode C. But it wouldn't really be that unreasonable for somebody to make that mistake, right? If they right. took off from Casa Grande, look, the runway literally lines up punching you into have, that, right? Right. Now, it's not, uh, here's the thing, it's up at 8,000 feet and, and the field elevation is 4, 1,400. Right. Mm -hmm. You're not yep. going to end up in it, you know, without trying, mm -hmm. but you could still end up underneath it and needing the equipment without having it. It's not right. You're in the lateral boundaries. That's what you're saying. Yep. So okay. what is this blue 75? So this is the maximum elevation figure or the lowest uh, flight altitude to fly. If you don't want to be, if you don't want to just, you know, navigate for, uh, uh, how do you say, or uh, without hitting anything on the ground? Yep. So it's not necessarily the highest obstacle because here's the highest obstacle, right? It gives no, you. That's, no, that's lower than this. If you're talking 7,500, that's 71, 71, 48. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying is it's not the highest obstacle. It is a clearance altitude. So if you were to maintain 7,500, okay. you're going to clear the highest obstacle in this yeah. grid. In the by squad, squad yeah. around 300 rounded up. Yes. Right. Um, <clears throat> so I'm happy with that. Let's go to aviationweather.gov and we're going to look at some weather. All right. Nah, that, that's too easy. <laughs> what was it? I never even seen that one. IWA. What was it? Uh, it's Indian. It's India Williams. Or uh, sorry, it's a uh, Williams Gateway. It's uh, just outside of Phoenix. Nah, never been there. Never seen that. Yeah, most <laughs> uh, unless you trained <laughs> unless you trained with ASU or no, UND, you, you ain't been there. No, no, you'd be surprised. But I flew to uh, with one of my friends. I flew to uh, Goodyear, and I think this is the longest cross country flight I did in the series. But he was flying. I wasn't. I, I was just riding well, along. It was a much better ride than a, than a Cherokee. Oh, yeah, definitely. So I got, right, what do we I, got? Phoenix. I got uh, I got the TAF pulled up for Phoenix, right? Um, okay. Can you tell me when to expect um, the strongest wind and what that wind would be? Yeah, sure. I know the wind's not very strong, but you know. <laughs> I'm not. And that's at 0300. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> let's go find some, let's go find a busier airport. Um, there you go. Now you got some, some serious stuff. Yep, so this yeah. Is for, so, yeah, no, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's what we used to get here, you know, the you know, last few uh, weeks in California, Southern California. Uh, so this one stands for uh, KORD, which is uh, 
O'Hare, I think. Yep. Illinois. Uh, on the 27th day uh, at 1951, zero, the winds are 250 at eight, gusting 24. Uh, wind uh, direction changes from 230 to uh, 290. Um, 10 statute miles scattered 3900. Uh, temperature 4 degrees plus minus uh, dew point minus 4. Altimeter 3006. Remarks coming from a station that can uh, detect uh, precipitation. And the last one is the actual temperature broken down to the digits. Yep. All right. Awesome. Um, when would be the lowest? Oh, uh, well, there's only one ceiling. Never mind. Uh, all right. I'm happy with that. You know how to read those. Um, <laughs> let's go here. What would you use this chart for? So this is like an overview map. Uh, the uh, Sorry, I'm terrible with names, man. No, nah, um, I, I care less if you can name the chart. It's a prog chart. I care less about chart. that. Yeah. Um, so what is, I what I'm really curious about is like what what kind of decisions would you make like okay. off of this chart? Like long term um, decisions, long long term. Flight? Yes, yes. Since we're flying, you know, high speed Cherokees, uh, you would do a long. Uh, you, you would look at this uh, chart uh, to make a, a go no go decision if you want to head on from California, let's say to Oregon or Washington or whatever. Uh, upper east, uh, I don't know what, Utah. And reason is because you want to look and, and check all, where all the high pressure, where all the low pressures, that'll give you probably either headwind or headwind or tailwind. Uh, where is the precipitation? And where is the precipitation uh, maybe at a certain you know amount of time from that point and on? Uh, what pressure gradient controlling the area and how that's going to affect you? Um, I think it's kind of like, again, it's an overview map. Yep. Awesome. What are these lines? So these are uh, pressure gradient lines or uh, isobars, what we All call right. them. So we can see we got a lot of them real close together as opposed to right here. It's pretty yeah. wide. What should not I expect? Yep. Huh? Very good. So I'm saying not only they're very close, they're associated with a low. If this was a high pressure system, it would be a Anyway, so it's a low, meaning it's a... Uh, Clockwise, I'm sorry, counterclockwise rotation to, to begin with, um, which associate with very high winds. The closer the uh, the isobars are, the stronger the wind is. Um, and I'm, I, I think I'm, if I'm right on that one, uh, the wind is going to be per perpendicular to the isobars. So that means in that in, the, in that uh, mode, it would be uh, the, the this storm is actually headed southeast. Um, awesome uh, yeah but you're good you're good you're telling me direction of the storm and all that jazz uh, that, that's <laughs> awesome all right okay. you, you, you went a whole lot deeper than i expected okay all, all right. right um that is awesome most students i mean let's be honest like they look at it and they're like how does this impact me like this is showing the country i'm not flying in the country i am flying you know, in you know my state one of the uh, things I realized during this whole training, and again, I've had the time, so the time is on my side, uh, but what I've realized is that people forget that these planes can only fly five hours, which is the endurance. In reality, you will not get over three and a half hours. And in them three and a half hours, if you get about five knots of headwind, you'll probably be covering maybe no more than 350 to 400 miles. That map you were just looking at is about 3,000 miles even more. So that's about, exactly. you'll, you'll be covering 10% of this whole thing. Just need to put it into perspective. Yep. And, you know, when I was ferrying airplanes, yeah, I'd look at those things more often. But now that I'm, like, staying in my own area, like, I don't, yeah. Like, I'm not I'm not really digging into that. All right. Um, what's yeah, the no, freezing, here, yeah. what's the freezing level in Texas? Uh, yeah, bring this up a little more. Okay. Freezing levels in Texas for... Uh, for what, 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 or which one? For uh, either North. of them. Uh, it's awesome that you okay. noticed there's two. <laughs> the farther north one. <laughs> okay, the farther north one is 8,000, I think. Yep, southern yeah, one. 8,000 and 12,000, if I see it right. 12,000 on the yep. lower portion? 12,000. Awesome. You know how to read those. Mm -hmm. mm. Ah, no, we're not going to Alaska. Let's go here. <laughs> okay. 
All right. All right. Uh, winds and temps, right? What is it? Uh, What's the winds and temps here? That's a good one. Uh, winds and temps on this one. So. So the winds are from the 240 at 106 knots and uh, minus 47 uh, degrees uh, Celsius. Awesome. Awesome. A uh, little bit of, just make sure, I'm, yep, I'm not missing anything. A little bit of aeronautical decision making, then we'll probably call it a day. Yeah, sure. Let me pull up my notes, right? Yes. Yeah, did that, did that, did that. All right. What are your personal minimums? I don't have any. Ah, so um, that's not a good thing, right? Wait, 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 wait. No, I, I got, I got something better than that. Talking about the three and a half hours endurance. Uh, most of the flying I do would be in the area around my around my house. Let's say within a hundred miles so far. So the idea is that uh, first of all, I know the airports very well. I know the terrain very well. And I know uh, at what uh, conditions I will not even take off. Uh, so I'm pretty much, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 I follow the weather very, you know, uh, how do you say, it? very consistently. So I can tell you that if, if it, when it comes to personal minimum, it would only apply if I go outside my comfort zone, meaning the area I operate on. But as long as I'm within that 50, 70 miles around here where I can just do a quick turnaround and come back or, you know, uh, shift to Van Nuys or just go down to Torrance or because there's so many airports in the area. Uh, and there's always going to be one that's going to have better uh, weather condition than the others. And after all that, again, if none of it falls into what I just said, then you have three and a half more hours to fly anywhere you want east and land this beach. So. That's so, why I, re I really don't complicate myself with this whole, you know, but, but I get where you're going with it. Well, but you specifically said there are conditions I won't even try in. Right. And those would be? Let's say if I, if I look out my house and I see that there are puffy clouds over my head that are about 2,000 feet, I won't even try it. Awesome, and I've had, awesome. And I have had canceled flights. I mean, uh, study flights, how do you say, you know, practice flights because of that. I, I, I solos that i've been pushing you know for a week it's just the way it goes yeah and that's the thing is like w w any student that i've i've had um when we start extending kind of the the training platform or the training you know profile over an extended period of time anything longer than six months uh we revisit personal minimums about every six months and have them write new ones down and talk about why the minimum, the personal minimums that you had six months ago don't apply yeah. anymore and what we've learned or what um, risk mitigation strategies we've implemented to quantify the reduction of our minimums, right? Like me personally, when, you know, I was flying around as, as, a, as, a, as a pilot for UND, I didn't care day, night, what have you, as long as it wasn't thunderstorms and 40 mile an hour winds, I'm fine. Now that I've got thousands of hours and have flown over 20 different airplanes, I don't fly single engine at night. All right. Like, Personal cool. minimums change as you develop. Okay. Um, and having them written down verifies that you're going to, to really abide by them. Um, I, I know four flight and Garmin pilot, they both have personal minimum kind of functions in the app. And if you get a weather briefing and the weather exceeds those minimums, it'll warn you saying, Hey, evaluate on whether or not you're going to go fly. And I know it feels weird. Cause you're like, I've got hundreds of, uh, you know, I've got all this time. I've been flying, doing all this stuff. I've learned so much. I should just be able to use my judgment by looking outside. The problem with just using my judgment in the moment is there is nothing to really reference. Um, from a previous time, like, hey, I set these minimums. This is where I was at those minimums. Am I doing better or am I doing worse from when I set these? And that's 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 my two cents on it is that it can feel like your judgment is great until you start to push your yourself beyond like the the example I, I use when me and my wife first started dating. Um, we went on a vacation, you know, we took an airplane somewhere. 
up to the Grand Canyon, actually. There's a little there's a little dirt strip over near a portion of the Grand Canyon, um, but it's completely outside of cell service. So it was impossible for us to get a weather briefing. Mm. Normally, I would go, mm -mm, I'm not doing that. I'm not going somewhere where I'm not going to even be able to get a weather briefing. Not happening. But as soon as a cute girl was involved, I was like, mm, that's probably okay. <laughs> we picked Take up ice one. on the way back. Uh, we picked up ice on the airplane oh on the way back God. and we had to make an emergency oh, diversion and an ILS into a different airport. Wow. Um, now, you see why I have them <laughs> written down? Because again, if I was to try that now, I'd be like, no, like you're cute and all, but maybe, no. No, yeah, um, yeah. I'm definitely, you should stick it on the dashboard if I may say, you know, just, you know, forget I'd this. have my students take a picture of it and uh, put it as their phone screen when they set their their personal minimums. Right. And everyone always thinks about weather when it comes to personal minimums. Think about length of flight, how long you've been flying. Um, you know, like if I just got out of a five hour flight, you know, or a four hour, what have you flight, um, do I really need to go for another two hours? No. Right. So don't just think about weather when it comes to personal minimums. Yeah. No, I hear you, man. You're right. Definitely. There's uh, many points in there. Yep. Um, <clears throat> now some pretty basic questions, alcohol, uh, what's the limitation for alcohol? 0.04, eight hours bottle to throttle. All right. Let's say you're hungover. Are you good? Nope. Nope. All right. Hungover is still another form of uh, basically of uh, not not being oh, how do you say being not fit to fly. Well, or under the influence, right? Uh, yeah. Being hungover is still counts as being under the influence. Because let's just be honest, alcohol just borrows happiness from tomorrow. Um, okay. Well, <laughs> in the event of a hangover. I, I don't right. think so. I'm good. Um. <clears throat> so. What's the required usage of oxygen? So if you're uh, staying at altitude more than 12,500 for more than uh, 30 minutes, uh, between 12,500 and 14,000 for more than 30 minutes, then you need to use, uh, uh, for the period of that time, you need to use uh, oxygen. If you're above 14,000 cabin altitude, but no higher than 15,000, then um, then you need to use it uh you know, constantly, uh, you know, from the, you know, all the time. And at 15,000, all, all uh, passengers and crew must have it, um, must have uh, supplemental oxygen, but uh, you can't force the, the uh, passengers to use it. The crew must have it. Yeah, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, right? Yep. Um, and we already talked about um, hypoxia. So what questions do you have for me? Am I ready? Yeah, I'd say you're doing, I'd say you're pretty, <laughs> yeah, you're pretty good. The only thing you, you, you missed in the way of like systems was what the fuel primer specifically does. Um, yeah. That was the only thing that, you know, we had to really correct. Um, but no, I'd say in the way of knowledge, you're, you're right where you should be, or you right where you belong. Uh, 91, 213, go read it. Right. Um, Cause when I asked like, Hey, what else is 91, 213 telling us to check? Right. Um, and I know we can look it up whenever we need to, but yeah, knowing those things is, 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 is a pretty good idea, right? I learned um, that, it, and it's going to sound funny, but uh, if you want to know something that's going to stick, that's going to stay, you have to relate it to an actual life experience. Otherwise, it's just like reading a book that no, that has no meaning. Yep. I mean, if you close the book, you forget it. So, And, and that's why, I, and I won't lie to you, I, I barely look at regs. I only started looking at regs, I think, in the last two months. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, it's building up. Yep. You know, but but I'm getting, again, I'm going, you know, every time I'm shifting to the page I need. And it'll, it'll come. It'll and that's good. the best way to do it, is to implement these regs into your day-to-day -day life. Okay? Even if you know, like, just based on the stuff that you've remembered, you've looked up, you you've learned over the times, right? Go reference it. Right? right. If you come up to the airplane and something's broken and be like, oh, well, I know I'm airworthy because mm -hmm. I know that I don't need that item. But let me go find the reg that specifically says that. And that's exactly what happened this morning. Yep. So I was going to fly a plane. I did the pre-trip. I found out the uh, landing light isn't working and the saw horn isn't working. But the saw horn isn't needed at, you know, per 91 to 05, but the landing light is. Yes, because and the I aircraft's being this. used for hire. Exactly. And I went back to the school and I'm like, yeah, you know, you can't, we can't, I can't use it. 
Yep. Yeah. Now, if it's own, if it's your personal airplane, do you need a landing light? No. No, I don't have one. It burns out all the time, so I never replace nah, it. Yeah. So again, as long as it's not being used commercially, commercially or for hire, it's not needed by many of these uh, regulations. Yep. But yeah, I mean, I'd say knowledge portion. You're you're right where you belong. You you should be just fine when it comes to uh, the knowledge portion of your check ride. Like all if right. you were my That's student, you, I, we'd go we'd go and do the flight. I appreciate that. So, all right. Well, I, I take it very seriously from you. I take it very much, you know, as, um, yeah. Cause I mean, you know, if you ask a bunch of my students, they'll tell you I'm a dick, but they always pass their check rides. So I can't be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, you do your job and they do theirs and that's the way it's going. Right? All that's right. <clears throat> do you enjoy the rest of your day? Adrian, thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. We no problem. Like just a word out of this whole thing. I really, I, I really think you're doing a great, work for the community with what you're doing. Uh, I, I think I'll be even more uh, open. I think grinding the students on this, cause it's more of a grinding thing. You go on subject and you grind it all the way, just like, you know, to extract whatever is in their head. And, and I think that's, that's what you should, that's what should be done, you know? Uh, and, and I think you're doing a big, uh, favor to the community, man. Well, I, I, I do my best. <laughs> I appreciate it. Hopefully this will help you promote your channel as well. Uh, and we'll see you again, probably in the future. All right. Sounds good. All right, man. <laughs> Bye. Take it easy, man. Bye.